Shalom, and welcome to Tov, the Jewish News Channel. My name is Ruchi Avital, and we have with us today a guest from abroad. His name is Francisco Gil White. He is an anthropologist and a historian. He has a website called managementofreality.com, and he invites you to visit it. And he has a lot to say about a lot of things. He's very, very well versed in Israel and what's happening here in Israel, the Israeli-Arab conflict, and also global trends and what's behind them, the most important part, what is behind them. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you for having me, Ruhi. Thank you for coming. Um, so perhaps you could introduce yourself to our viewers and tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got to where you are right now. Okay, well, uh, who I am professionally is I am an anthropologist. I, I studied uh, sociocultural and evolutionary anthropology simultaneously. Um, and I became very interested in, from the beginning, in studying all kinds of political topics. But mostly I was interested in the question of racism and ethnic conflict. So my PhD thesis from UCLA Anthropology focuses on producing a new theory to explain the origin of racism. Uh, then when I was hired at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the psychology uh, department on the strength of that theory, um, I became very interested in the Arab-Israeli conflict because they, they also hired me at a think tank housed in the, at the University of Pennsylvania. It was a joint project of the political science and uh, psychology departments. Um, and one of the main uh, areas of interest of this think tank was the Arab-Israeli conflict. So even though up to then I had not been especially focused on the Arab-Israeli conflict or in anti-Semitism, I now took, started taking a much stronger interest in those topics, and I began studying the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which meant that on the one hand, I was studying the history of Zionism, and on the other hand, I was studying the history of the Arab-Palestinian movement. Uh, and to make a long story short, one of the things I found studying the history of the Arab-Palestinian movement was that uh, the founder of that movement, a man by the name Haj Amin al-Husseini, uh, had uh, organized several terrorist attacks against the Jews in the Yishuv, in British Mandate Palestine. And when the World War broke out, well, I should say the, the fourth of those great terrorist attacks against the Jews of Mandate Palestine uh, was organized with weapons sent by Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. And when the war broke out, when World War II broke out, uh, Husseini uh, went first to, he, he had been the Mufti of Jerusalem, and now he, he, he created so much violence in Mandate Palestine that the British felt they needed to do something about that. So he escapes. Uh, he goes to Iraq, where he organizes the Farhud, which was a giant pogrom of the Baghdadi Jews and the Jewish life in Baghdad. And then he went to uh, Rome, where he was received by Mussolini like a head of state. And finally to Berlin, where he again was received as a head of state and uh, was turned into a top Nazi. They gave him an entire bureaucracy, a budget, he uh, used that to, uh, his bureaucracy was called Buro des Gros Mufti, because he was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Uh, and he used that power to organize entire SS divisions for Heinrich Himmler that participated uh, in the Yugoslav chapter of the Holocaust. These were SS divisions made up of Bosnian Muslims and Albanian Muslims, Kosovo Muslims. Uh, and then, uh, it, it, he became the partner and best friend to Adolf Eichmann. And together with Adolf Eichmann, they administered, they created and administered the entire death camp system that murdered the European Jewish population in World War II. So that's I the think, founder. I think, even, I think even in Israel, not everyone is aware of Husseini's I mean, I think most people know who he is, but people are not aware enough 
of his part in the Holocaust. I mean, there's a famous no. picture of him seated with uh, uh, Adolf Hitler, very friendly. You are. And yeah. Yeah. You are correct. Most people don't know about this, even in Israel. I was able to um, ascertain that uh, years ago when I made a trip to give a few conferences in Israel. Uh, and I was speaking to the people who are most interested in the defense of Israel, the patriots on what they call the Israeli right, uh, the small movements and so forth. They were very ill informed about this. Uh, and they also didn't know that uh, after organizing the final solution, Husseini, uh, he was not tried at Nuremberg. He, he escaped to Cairo. And in Cairo, he's the guy who created Al Fatah. Uh, he gave uh, Yasser Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas German Nazi training because many German Nazis were coming to uh, Cairo to seek refuge with Gamal Abdel Nasser. So maybe we'll and get so to that we'll a little bit later. Let's just sure. uh, segue back to your personal story. So you discovered all this material about the origins of the Palestinian National Movement and how Husseini uh -huh. and how his role in the Holocaust had been memory holed out of history. Kind of. That's right. He was erased from history. Erased. And how did that affect you? Well, uh, when I found out about Husseini's role in the Holocaust, it seemed to me that uh, so, uh, the public should know about it, because if you are thinking about the Arab-Israeli conflict and you're thinking, for example, about the logic of the Oslo process, you can't possibly understand what's really going on unless you know about Husseini. So the story that most people have in their heads is this, uh, you know, public story that they were sold, which says that PLO FATA, which is the organization that Husseini created, it's what we now call the Palestinian Authority. So what they told people was that the PLO had changed its colors. It, it had become a peace oriented organization that wanted to live in peace with the Israeli Jews if they could only get a piece of territory for their own quote unquote Palestinian state. So um, so this is the story that so, people have. So in their this head. was not this was not a popular this was not a popular opinion. No, this is this is this is um, forgive me. So let's go back a little. So you thought it was important to to bring that story out, and how That's did right, that affect your career? People, yes. So, so people had this story about the PLO uh, abandoning terrorism and now being interested in peace. But if you know the history of Haj Amin al Husseini, which people didn't know, it begins to look very different because the entire purpose for Husseini of creating Al Fatah, which by 1970 becomes the PLO because they swallowed the PLO. Uh, he created Al Fatah in order to continue the genocide in Israel. That was the entire purpose of Al Fatah. So if you know the story of Al Husseini, when you look at the Oslo process, it begins to look like an attack on Israel uh, for the following reason. It is impossible that the people who organized the Oslo process, namely the U.S. bosses, the people running the United States, didn't know about Al Husseini because it took me only two weeks of library work in my university library to learn all about him. It, it's it's not as if this information is difficult to find. It's just that they well, never you have to want to find it. Media. Number one, you have to want to find it. Yeah. And number two, yeah. you don't really have to know that because even as the Oslo process was happening, Fatah was still blowing up buses and restaurants Correct. in Israel. So if you just That's were exactly willing right. to look so, at reality in the face, you could see it. You didn't even have to know history for that. You just had to read the newspapers and look at the pictures without reading the editorials. Yes. However, uh, most people don't have the time or the inclination to do any research, and they are very respectful of what they hear in the mainstream media. So. I was one of those people. I was very respectful of the mainstream media. But when I began doing this research, I realized that many things had been hidden from me. So what I did is I published an article uh, explaining the entire history of the Arab-Palestinian movement and the role that the founder of the movement, Haj Amin al-Husseini, had played uh, 
uh, in destroying the European Jewish population, uh, and also his role in creating Al Fatah, which the U.S. government was now forcing uh, Israel to accept in in strategic territory of the Jewish state because. Judea, Samaria, and Gaza are militarily strategic. Uh, so I published an article with the, the entire history that uh, had been suppressed. And the consequence for me, which was your question, uh, was that I was fired from the University of Pennsylvania, which was very surprising to me and how, how did that, uh, launched me. How did that come about? That just sounds like, I mean, what happened to academic freedom and, and so on? Uh, I, I'm, I'm asking seriously. I mean, people publish articles all the time, and this was back in the 90s, I assume. Uh, this was in the early 2000s. Early 2000s, okay. Yeah. So what happened was, uh, yeah, so you asked me about academic freedom. There's no such thing. Uh, that's what I discovered. Uh, there's no, no respect for the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, if, if you say things that are critical of the Arab-Palestinian movement, uh, you become persona non grata. And the first thing I was told was that uh, I shouldn't be saying this, uh, that I should stop talking about this. And so that, and that was especially surprising to me because I was doing the job that they had hired me to do. So I was, I was an expert on racism and ethnic conflict. They had hired me to teach racism and ethnic conflict uh, uh, as an academic uh, topic. Uh, I had been offered a position in a think tank called the Solomon Ash Center for Study of Ethnopolitical Conflict that was entirely focused on ethnic conflict. And the Arab-Israeli conflict was the most important topic at that think tank. So here I was writing a history of that conflict. I was doing the job that they had hired me to do but the problem was I was not saying what I was supposed to say. I was not saying that the Israelis were the bad guys and that the Arab Palestinians were the good guys. I was merely publishing the history of the Arab Palestinian movement with its Nazi in words, origins. In other words, you didn't follow the oppressor oppressed um, rule. Well, I didn't. I, I, I suggested to my readers that the Jews were still the oppressed, like they always have been. Wow. So what happened after that? So the, the first thing they said is, you can't talk about this. And I, I, I said, look, if I have said anything that is wrong or exaggerated even, uh, then if you give me the information that will refute me, uh, I will retract myself publicly tomorrow. I mean, I, I have no interest in telling lies, so just show me where I went wrong. And the reply was, uh, no, your, your documentation is impeccable. They used that word. Uh, they said, but you can't say this. And if you insist in saying this, uh, you're going to have to get yourself a new job. <laughs> so I wow. got myself a new job. So that, that's quite a high price to pay for intellectual honesty. So bravo to you for well, that. It was, it, was, it was very annoying because I was very happy being a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. So I was not happy about that. But on the other hand, <clears throat> I was very excited to start finding out how the world really works. Uh, so there was a big payoff for me in that because I'm a very curious person. And so this launched me into a research process to try to understand the structure of the West because it was clear to me that there was something about the West that I didn't really understand because the entire story that I had heard my whole life was that the United States was the big protector of Israel. But if the United States is forcing the organization created by the exterminator of the European Jews onto the Jewish state, when the Jewish state was created to protect the Jewish people from you know, Nazi genocides, then what was the United States doing introducing this organization created by the Nazi killer of the Jews into the Jewish state? That obviously meant to me that I didn't understand the world. So I started researching the entire history of U.S. foreign policy towards the Jewish people and towards the Jewish state. And what I found when I started looking at this information without the filter of the mainstream media and mainstream academia, was that uh, U.S. foreign policy towards Israel had been anything but uh, uh, 
uh, favorable. The, the United States foreign policy, in my conclusion, after doing all this research, it has been designed to undermine the security of the Jewish state. And lately, this has become very obvious to people who are paying attention to the behavior of U.S. bosses in the wake of uh, uh, October 7th. But um, bef before that, it was a lot harder to notice because of the bar barrage of m mainstream media and established academia. So I, I, I'm going to ask you just uh, a simple person's question. A simple sure. person, we, we, we know, I, I think I can hear you making a distinction between the American people and the American government and American policies. They're not the same. The American people are generally favor, very highly favorable towards Israel. We see that in poll after That's poll right. after poll, even or especially even since October 7th. And behind the scenes, we know there's all kinds of stuff going on that we don't understand. We don't understand why President Biden came to Israel and he, he spoke very movingly about his commitment to Israel's safety and future and said, don't. But then there were some people who were saying that don't wasn't directed only at Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah, but it was directed at Israel also. Is that what you're saying? Well, clearly, because um, the entire thrust of U.S. diplomacy towards Israel since October 7th has been geared towards stopping Israel from achieving a real victory over its enemies. Uh, and not only that, we know that uh, uh, shortly before the Hamas attack of October 7th, the U.S. released uh, billions of dollars for Iran. And after the Israeli operation in Gaza began, they sent $100 million to Hamas. Uh, but it's even worse than that, because we know that the U.S. bosses are very intimately allied with Qatar. Uh, they have their most important military base in the Middle East in Qatar. And Qatar cannot exist without U.S. protection. I mean, Qatar is a tiny little peninsula, completely flat, entirely made of sand, with the biggest gas reserves in the world. So obviously it is a prize for anybody who wants to conquer Qatar, which means that Qatar cannot exist without U.S. military protection, which in turn means that the U.S. has total control over Qatari foreign policy. And what is Qatari foreign policy? It is to support and fund the uh, psychopathic terrorists of Hamas who are entirely oriented publicly towards the genocidal destruction of the Jewish state. So this is very confusing. Uh, this is very confusing for this simple person. We I mean, I remember when President Obama made his first speech, which was in Cairo, first international speech in Cairo, and he basically yeah. threw Mubarak under the bus in favor of yeah. the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood That's is right. also Qatar and also Hamas. Um, what, what is the end game here for the United States? I mean, it's very difficult to understand for not the United well, States, but for not. the policymakers or the State Department, perhaps, in the United States. Exactly. That's, that distinction is very important. So it's, it's not an end game for the United States. The United States is a, a few hundred million people. Uh, no, this is an end game for the U.S. bosses, the people running the system. And in order to understand what they want, you have to do a little history to know what their ideology is. Uh, for me, a very important book uh, to understand all this has been Edwin Black's uh, War Against the Weak, Eugenics and America's Campaign to Create a Master Race. That book is a watershed because what Edwin Black documented was that the people running the United States were also the people running the international eugenics movement in the first half of the 20th century. And that's Perhaps you key. explain to our listeners or our viewers exactly what eugenics is. Yes, I was going to. So th that's key because uh, the eugenics movement is the parent movement that produced German Nazism. OK, uh, eugenics is the original ideology of the alleged, you know, biological superiority 
of the Germanic stock. That's that's what eugenics is. And and they were always interested in destroying modern democracy because the eugenics argument is that uh, people in the in the in the lower classes don't have enough G Germanic blood and therefore they are mentally retarded. This is what they claim. And so they created these IQ tests so that they had a pseudoscientific because they're a fraud. And, and this gave them a pseudoscientific excuse to start eliminating the rights and liberties of ordinary people in the modern West. The German Nazis are the evolution of German eugenics. German eugenics was funded and led from the United States. To give you an example, the 1935 Nuremberg laws of Hitler, those laws which started carting people off to uh, concentration camps, those laws are modeled on the legal precedents in the United States that were achieved by the American eugenicists. So if you look at the history of the uh, early, of the first half of the 20th century in the United States, you see that in 1924, there was a very important Supreme Court case called Buck versus Bell. Buck versus Bell was a great victory for the eugenicists because it made legal the forced, forcible sterilization or incarceration of people that the eugenicists decided were feeble-minded with these fraudulent eugenic uh, uh, IQ tests. Uh, and they started putting people in concentration camps in the United States. And this is something that most people don't know about anymore because the history of eugenics has also been suppressed. When I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, I would ask my students to raise their hands if they recognized the word eugenics and very few hands would go up. I was not asking them to explain the history of eugenics, just to Have recognize them, the term. Did you ever ask them if they recognize the name Margaret Sanger? Well, uh, they also don't know anything about that. So Margaret Sanger who was the founder of Planned Parenthood, which was an integral uh, component of the eugenics movement. Um, and uh, some people who read about eugenics do find out about Margaret Sanger, but the, the dots that they never get to connect, which is what Edwin Black has done for us, is they never get to connect the fact that the most important leaders and financiers of the eugenics movement, people like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Henry Ford, uh, uh, Thomas Watson, the guy who was running IBM, these people were sending a lot of money to Germany a lot of money to Germany, helping create the German eugenics movement that became German Nazism. This was all coming from the US power elite. So once you understand that the people running the United States are eugenicists who are very fond of the German Nazis and helped the German Nazis get set up, once you know that, you can begin to understand the post-war foreign policy of the United States because nobody removed the eugenicists from power in the United States. Wow. I mean, I, the names Ford and Rockefeller and so on uh, resonate very strongly with all kinds of conspiracy theories, which are probably not theories. And Joseph Kennedy as well, I believe, was one of those power brokers, was he not? Yes, Joseph Kennedy was uh, a very pro-Nazi. He was ambassador to the United States uh, in uh, Great Britain. And he was indeed uh, instrumental in all of this. So this is all extremely disturbing. And uh, we hear very, very little of this. It, there doesn't seem to be any public interest or any interest, I wouldn't say public, but journalistic interest in uncovering any of this. Does journalism even well, still exist? No, it hasn't existed for a long time. So uh, the eugenicist took over the entire media and academic establishment a very long time ago. This began in the late 19th century when people like John D. Rockefeller and uh, uh, Senior and other great industrialists began taking over the big media and also established academia. So uh, Rockefeller, together with Carnegie, created some, something called the General Board of Education uh, and that 
with their donations, they started taking over the university system. If you look at the grants for research in the United States from the early 20th century to the present, uh, you'll see that the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, the Ford Foundation have been the main sources of money for scientific research. Uh, and by doing that, they've basically taken over the uh, university establishment. <clears throat> they've also taken over the big media. Uh, one thing that's very important to understand is that uh, the American eugenicists, uh, in particular the Rockefellers, were completely, very heavily involved in the creation of U.S. intelligence. And uh, U.S. intelligence, or the, let us say, the, the main U.S. intelligence infrastructure was created in 1947 with the National Security Act. When they did that, they incorporated the people that Rockefeller had been putting together to study psychological warfare in the 1930s. So the Rockefellers had had an entire scientific project to study how to use the mass media to manipulate democratic citizens. That was going on in the 30s. Those researchers became the psychological warfare experts of the United States during World War II. And after World War II, they became the professors of communications research in high prestige universities that were, and these professors were being funded by the CIA clandestinely so that they would create these communications departments that train absolutely everybody that works in the media, uh, uh, in the modern media system. So through the uh, intelligence services, the eugenicists acquired control of the entire media space uh, that, uh, quote unquote, informs people about what's what's supposedly going on. So uh, I'd like to jump forward to this week. On uh, Monday evening, there was a um, groundbreaking interview on Twitter, Twitter space, uh, where Elon Musk interviewed uh, Donald Trump for a few hours, I think. Um, <laughs> Is that, is it just my imagination or is that really a fly in the ointment of this control of the media? No, I think that's your imagination. So uh, I think uh, Donald Trump should not be considered any different from Joe Biden. I think that's a show. Uh, don't forget that Donald Trump is a reality TV actor. Don't forget that Donald Trump's first trip uh, first official trip after he became president was to Saudi Arabia to give them billions of dollars in uh, armament. Uh, don't forget that Saudi Arabia is the country in the world that gets the most weapons from the United States. And Saudi Arabia has a long history of uh, funding terrorist movements uh, that seek to destroy the state of Israel. So. Uh, I, I think Trump is a phony baloney. I don't think uh, there's any uh, reality to uh, uh, the, his presentation of self. Um, and he would have never become president uh, the first time if he were not part of the system. He's a reality TV actor playing a scripted role. Remember, he was a lifelong Democrat. Uh, and before he uh, started his, uh, you know, his first presidential campaign, uh, which was very focused on Mexicans and uh, uh, was very carefully designed so that he would look like a racist who hated Mexicans, blah, blah, blah. That's all a show. Before that, Trump had been defending Mexicans. He, he's a shell. There's nothing there. He just he's, he's playing a scripted role and it's all part of the same system. And he, he he's not going to do anything for Israel. That's not going to happen. Who is scripting the role? Oh, the, the, the U.S. government, in my opinion, and I've explained this in detail uh, uh, in, uh, on our website, managementofreality.com, the, the U.S. government is run from the intelligence services. This has been going on for a long time. Look, the National Security Act of 1947 explicitly says that the CIA has legal permission to initiate any activity at any time without asking anybody. This means they have absolute power within the confines of the intelligence budget. And it turns out that the intelligence budget 
is for practical purposes infinite because it is a state secret. So uh, when, when they passed the National Security Act of 1947, they completely destroyed US democracy. The US intelligence can do whatever it wants without asking anyone. That means that they well, correct have Correct me if I'm wrong, reign. but the CAA at least officially is not supposed to act within the borders of the United States. Well, that is technically true, but how do you control them when when they act completely in secret and they have permission well, well, that to I understand the and that and that kind of segues to the Homeland Security Act after 9-11, um, which does allow uh, spying on American citizens in the United States. Right. So what what they've been doing since the Patriot Act is that they've been uh, formalizing what they were already doing. So they were already spying on Americans. They can do whatever they want since 1947, and they do whatever they want. To give you just one example, <laughs> it was documented in the U.S. Congress, in the U.S. Senate, in the period 1975 to 1977, that the U.S. military had been dropping experimental bioweapons on millions of U.S. citizens. Again, this was documented in the U.S. Senate in the period 1975 to 1977. Nobody knows about it because it's nobody talks about it. But the, I can show you a Washington Post article about this exposure from 1977. This is public knowledge. Millions of U.S. citizens had bioweapons dropped on them by the U.S. military. They were testing their bioweapons on U.S. citizens. Millions. They do whatever they want. So let's move back again to the subject we discussed earlier, and that's Israel and the United States. Yes. What exactly is the end plan for Israel as far as the United States is concerned? Not the United States, again, the State Department, let's say. Yes, good. I, I love that distinction. But I don't like to say the U.S. State Department, because the U.S. State Department is not independent of the executive. It is part of the executive. And therefore, the U.S. State Department always does what the president wants. There is no independence there. This is the State Department is simply an expression of what the U.S. bosses want to do. And uh, what they want to do is destroy the state of Israel. Why? Why? Because they're eugenicists. Eugenicists want to destroy democracy. And the Jewish people is the origin of modern democracy. This is why the Jewish people is attacked with such violence. The reason we have modern democracy in the West is a consequence of the Enlightenment, the European Enlightenment. The European Enlightenment is a development of Judeo-Christian ethics. And in particular, the Enlightenment is a consequence of the thought of one philosopher, Baruch Spinoza. Baruch Spinoza was a Jewish philosopher trained in the Talmud. He was uh, oriented towards the thought of Moses Maimonides, the Rambam. And uh, thanks to the ethical and political thought of Baruch Spinoza, which was very influential with all of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment, the, 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 the European thought, the, thought, the in, intellectual Europeans moved their thought in the direction of giving rights to everyone. And that, that intellectual movement is what produced the, the, the modern revolutions that bequeathed to us modern democracy. It all comes from Jewish thought because Baruch Spinoza, as I said, was producing a development of the thought of uh, Moses Maimonides, the great uh, medieval Jewish philosopher. And Moses Maimonides was himself developing what he had learned in the Talmud and uh, reading the Torah. Now, why is this? Why is it true? Why, why is it that Jewish thought can produce all of this change in uh, European civilization? Well, because the, the, the Jewish movement was founded on the story of a slave revolt. All of Jewish identity and all of Jewish law is based on the Exodus story of a slave revolt organized by the ancient Israelites against their oppressor, the Egyptian Pharaoh. After the Israelites achieve their freedom and are living in the uh, Sinai desert away from Pharaoh, what do they receive? They receive a new law, the new law of the escaped slaves designed so that they can live in freedom without oppression. 
So the Jewish movement is the original movement that fights against oppression and Jewish legal precedent and thought is what inspired, what influenced Europeans to move away from medieval totalitarian uh, oppression and towards modern democracy. The eugenicists understand that and they also understand that if they want to enslave all of all Westerners, one of the most important things they need to do is get rid of the Jews because the Jews are the people who taught us how to be free. It's actually earlier. It's with the creation of man in the Bible. If we believe that God created Adam and all human beings are descended from Adam and Eve, then they're all equal. All human beings well, but, are uh, equal in the eyes my, of God. My explanation, my ex well, of course. So, so the the idea that we are all equal in the eyes of God and therefore should all be equal under the law is a Jewish idea. Uh, before being a Jewish idea, it was a Babylonian idea. So, the, the, uh, I'm explaining this in the website. There's a, a, a more even more ancient movement that I call Babylonian Semitism that created a culture in Mesopotamia that said that the king had to be responsible for the protection of ordinary citizens and had to produce ethical laws that would uh, guarantee the rights and the liberties of everybody under the king's authority. That ideology, which I call Semitism, was created by the Semitic peoples of Mesopotamia, starting with the Akkadians and then the Amorites, then the Chaldeans, Aramaeans, Hebrews. They all participated of this uh, uh, ideology, which lasted for 2,000 years in Mesopotamia. And the Jews, Judaism is the most exquisite, most sophistic, sophisticated legal and religious product of that Mesopotamian civilization. And it is thanks to the fact that the Jews migrated west and settled in the Mediterranean and began converting the Greeks and the Romans to Judaism that the West was transformed from a psychopathic civilization because the ancient Greeks and the Romans were psychopaths. Uh, they, they had giant populations of slaves that they were torturing to death. For example, in the, in the Athenian mines of Laurion, the Athenians were working to death tens of thousands of slaves. The, these were death camps. So they were, they were the ancient Nazis. But the influence of the Jews in the West began transforming the Greeks and the Romans. And uh, gradually, over the centuries, the West became the best. It, it had been the worst place in the world. And thanks to Jewish influence, it became the best place in the world. But the people at the top, the people running the Western system, are hypocrites. They never changed their minds. They are still anti-Semites. They are still in love with the Greco-Romans. So they are still organizing political processes to destroy the Jews in the hope of returning us to slavery. That's what the big program is about. Wow, that is a lot to take in. Uh, it is. I, there are people in American history, in American uh, contemporary history, that don't seem to fit that pattern. Leaders, people like, if I go back, Abraham Lincoln, to go back, all the presidential administrations fall in line with this theory, with this model? Well, I think it, it, it's not necessarily all of them, but you can certainly see a, a very strong pattern. So if, if you, so the problem is that the history we learned in school is part of this propaganda sphere that has created around us. So when you learn in school about the founding of the United States, you get this story about how wonderful the founding fathers supposedly were and what great Democrats and political geniuses they supposedly were. Uh, and it, people are ne it is never explained to people that the, that the so-called founding fathers, in fact, were trying to uh, achieve where they were trying to neutralize the democratic movement in the United States. There was a democratic movement. It, it was a popular movement. But George Washington took over the Continental Army and turned what had been a revolutionary movement into an independence movement. Not the same thing. And all of the people that we call the founding fathers, in fact, betrayed the popular revolutionary movement uh, uh, once they took over the leadership. Remember, these were all slave owners. 
George Washington, uh, ha Hamilton, Jefferson, etc. They were all slave owners and they never freed their slaves. And the Constitution of the United States that these people created enshrined slavery. It, so the, the original Constitution of the United States says that blacks are three fifths of a person and they were given no rights in the southern states. That was all protected by the U.S. Constitution. The, the thing that people admire in the U.S. Constitution is the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights. And I agree that the Bill of Rights is a wonderful thing, but the Bill of Rights was not created by the Founding Fathers. The Bill of Rights is a series of amendments. Amendment means that it was not in the original Constitution. And the reason they had to put him in is that the popular movement, the true revolutionary movement in the United States, made it known that they would not accept the Constitution if these amendments were not added. And so against the wishes of the Founding Fathers, they were forced to include these amendments because the popular revolutionary movement was demanding them. So we got freedom of speech, freedom of association, uh, the right to bear arms, et cetera, et cetera, thanks to the true popular movement. Now, let me add one more thing. The true popular movement that started the revolution in the United States was creating parliaments in the states, in the, in the colonies that were becoming states. And these parliaments were unicameral, they were uh, populist, and many of them were abolishing slavery. So these, that, that was the real uh, uh, revolutionary movement that the founding fathers betrayed. And the history that people learn in school has been a whitewash uh, to raise the prestige of the so-called founding fathers, uh, which has made it very difficult for people to understand what really happened. There's, a, there's an academic at the University of Pennsylvania uh, who wrote a, a, a wonderful book called Civic Ideas. I forget his, his name right now, but we can check it. Uh, and what he documents is that the ideology of the people who, who we now celebrate as the founding fathers was profoundly racist. Uh, and they were not interested in extending rights uh, to, not even to all white Americans, let alone uh, blacks, Native Americans, etc. So uh, the history people have in their heads is uh, uh, a, a myth. Uh, and uh, okay. uh, even though, it, it, hold on, just one more thing. It's certainly true that the United States has progressively become a more and more democratic country. But the reason is that ordinary Americans who are the salt of the earth have been pushing for this from below. It has not been a gift from the people that we call the Founding Fathers. Okay, so I'd like to uh, talk about now um, a similar but different subject about American influence in the Middle East and what the, what the end game is. What does the United States see as the future of the Middle East? It, you said earlier that it doesn't want Israel to win this war. What does it want? Oh, it wants Iran to win this war. Foreign policy of the United States has been pro-Iranian from the beginning. I can give you many, many items of evidence to support this, but I'll give you the most dramatic one. So the organization created by Haj Amin al-Husseini is Al-Fatah. Al-Fatah took over the PLO by 1970. So I always say PLO Fatah. PLO Fatah is the creator of Iran. I, I learned that most people in Israel don't remember this, uh, even the people who are very focused on defending Israel. When I made a trip to Israel years ago to talk about this, nobody remembered that Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas had created Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of Jihadi Iran. Nobody remembered it. Uh, but this was on the front page of the New York Times, and you can go check it after our interview. This was on the front page of the New York Times and other newspapers in the period 1979 to 1981, which is the Iranian Revolution and right after, right? Everybody was openly talking about the fact that Arafat had placed Khomeini in power in Tehran because PLO Fatah, what we now call the Palestinian Authority, trained and armed Khomeini's guerrillas in uh, training camps in Lebanon in the 1970s. So it was uh, PLO Fatah, Arafat and Abbas who put Khomeini in power in Tehran. And after that happened, they were invited by Khomeini to Tehran 
to create the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, which exports Iranian terrorism all over the world. They are the creators of Hezbollah. And to create Savama, which is the Iranian uh, political police, the secret police that is used to oppress Iranians. And they also became, for a while, basically the foreign ministry of Iran. So when the, when the um, hostage crisis developed, because uh, Khomeini uh, took hostage the entire U.S. embassy in, in Tehran, and there were these negotiations to see how to get the hostages freed, it was PLO Fatah who was in charge of the negotiations on behalf of the Iranian regime. Now, everybody has forgotten about this because starting around 1983, more or less, uh, the relationship between PLO Fatah and Iran was never discussed again. It was never mentioned again in the uh, big media, and it was never mentioned again in established academia. And when big media and established academia stop talking about something, it takes only about two or three years for everybody to forget about it. We have several demonstrations of this on our website. So, so what did the U.S. I, I, I'm government I'm a little do? confused. If the, if the U.S. government supported Iran and supported Khomeini, why did Khomeini's thugs overrun the American embassy in Tehran and take all the employees hostage? And why do they burn American flags and call America the great Satan and so on? Because you need to believe that Iranian bosses and U.S. bosses are enemies. You need to believe that U.S. bosses are friends of Israel. In order to produce that theater, some dramatic uh, um, you know, events need to be organized and produced. So, uh, and it works. So that's why they did it. But notice what the policy is, because the policy is where you learn what they really want. The policy of U.S. bosses was to forcibly introduce PLO Fatah into Israel. They threatened Israeli leaders in order to get this result. PLO Fatah had already been destroyed, basically, by Menachem Begin in 1982. Menachem Begin invaded Lebanon, where, they, where PLO Fatah had its base, and they basically destroyed PLO Fatah. The, the, re, the few remaining leaders of PLO Fatah escaped to Tunis, and they basically had been destroyed. They couldn't do anything uh, after that. So what the U.S. government did is it revived PLO Fatah by creating the Oslo process, <clears throat> and it threatened Israel to accept PLO Fatah in militarily strategic uh, territory of the Jewish state. So what did they do? They introduced Iran into militarily strategic territory of the Jewish state because PLO Fatah is the daddy of Iran. So that's what US, the, the U.S. government did. And that, by paying attention to that, is where you learn what their real intentions are. So you're saying that, you're not, that the U.S. government is continuing to arm Israel only to appease its own voters? Well, it, it, it's, it's continuing to arm Israel in order to preserve the uh, appearance of an alliance with Israel. And, of course, as you said, to appease American citizens who would be horrified to understand that U.S. bosses are actually assisting the Iranian attacks against Israel. So yes, this is part of the show, but it's, a, it's very important to do the algebraic sum. So when you do the algebraic sum and you subtract from the uh, aid, military aid that Israel gets from the United States, the aid that the United States, the military aid and, and military weapons that the United States sends to the enemies of Israel, when you perform that algebraic sum, you get, a, you get a number that is negative for Israel. The enemies of Israel are getting way more than Israel gets. Don't forget, in the 1980s, it was discovered in the middle of the 1980s that Ronald Reagan was sending billions of dollars in weapons every year to Ayatollah Khomeini. This was called the Iran-Contra scandal, and now everybody has forgotten about it. But it, the Iran-Contra scandal is diagnostic about what the U.S. bosses are doing. When they got caught sending billions of weapons to their allegedly worst enemy, Ayatollah Khomeini, they said, oh, we were doing it to try to and free some American hostages that had been taken by Hezbollah in, 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 in Lebanon. That was their public excuse. Years later, we found out that it couldn't be true because 
Several investigations showed that the secret arms to Khomeini began in 1981. The first hostage was taken in Lebanon in 1982. So obviously the decision to start sending billions of dollars in weapons to Khomeini had absolutely nothing to do with hostages. And it is perfectly consistent with the rest of US foreign policy. Think about the invasion of Iraq. Iraq was invaded on the excuse that Iraq supposedly had weapons of, of mass, destruction, mass destruction, which then they said they couldn't find, right? Well, Iran has been developing weapons of mass destruction. Everybody agrees they're developing a nuclear bomb, but they never invade Iran. They invaded Iraq. Iraq was the rival of Iran. And by invading Iraq and creating a chaos, a terrorist chaos there that didn't exist before, the U.S. invasion of Iraq basically gifted Iraq to Iran. Iran now controls Iraq. And, it and thanks to the U.S. invasion of Iraq, Iran now has a land corridor all the way to the northern border of Israel. This is something I predicted would happen before the U.S. invasion, because so, so what uh, should Israel do? So what should Israel do? Israel should defend itself. Israel should stop listening to the U.S. government. Stop taking directions from the U.S. government. Stop appeasing uh, the U.S. bosses every time the U.S. bosses say that. Uh, uh, Israeli defense is a quote-unquote escalation. That's what Israel should do. But Israel is not going to do that uh, so long as the current leadership stays in power because the current leadership is not really a leadership. These are not leaders of the Jews. These are servants of the eugenicists. That's what they are. So the only way is Israel has a path forward is if uh, Israelis uh, uh, vote in a completely different government one that is interested in defending the Jewish state. This is the most right-wing government Israel has ever had. And Netanyahu is a student of history. He must know a lot of what you've said. Certainly the chronology well, I of the a, events. I, I have a historical fact for you that is going to be very uncomfortable to that interpretation. Remember, we just got saying that Pilo Fata is the creator of Iran. And therefore, introducing Pio Fata into militarily strategic territory of Israel is an attack against Israel. The guy who got that done has a name, and his name is Benjamin Netanyahu. Benjamin Netanyahu is the guy that Yitzhak Shamir took to the Madrid Peace Conference of 19, 1991 because he, he, he was not a friend of Michael Levy, who was the, the, the uh, foreign minister at the time. Dav so instead David, of taking Michael Levy... David Levy. Uh, uh, Oh, forgive me, David Levy, thank you. Uh, so instead of taking Levy, he took the uh, undersecretary, who was uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and Netanyahu was the star of the Madrid Peace Conference, and he's the one who broke the taboo. He violated the taboo of Israeli politics, which was never to negotiate with PLO Fata. Those negotiations began in 1991 under Netanyahu's auspices, in Madrid, and from Netanyahu's negotiations, the, the Oslo process then evolved. So it was Netanyahu that, that got Pilo Fata into Israel. So you can say he's, it's a right-wing government, but in my opinion, that doesn't mean a thing. It's just a show. The, the, uh, Netanyahu, look, Netanyahu has done this every single time. Every time he runs for office, he very loudly claims that he's going to oppose the Oslo process and roll it back and blah, blah, blah. And then once they elect him, he does the exact opposite. He has moved the Oslo process forward faster even than the so-called leftist uh, uh, bosses of Israel. So uh, I, I don't believe a word coming out of Netanyahu's mouth. And, and the way that he has conducted this war makes it obvious that he's not trying to win it. Netanyahu is fighting a, a huge opposition from the left to stop the war, and he's continuing the war. The left wants well, Israel I mean, to if, give if in. Netanyahu really I, mean, I mean, a lot of people on the right are saying that the left take their marching orders directly from Washington, and it certainly appears that way. And Netanyahu is fighting right. them tooth and, and nail. Okay, so my model of Netanyahu is the same model I have about Trump. I think he's an actor. And look, if, 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 if Netanyahu is the guy who got the Oslo process started, and the Oslo process is what brought Iran into military strategic territory of Israel, case closed.
Case closed. You don't really need to say anything else. Wow. Uh, it doesn't seem that way. Netanyahu pays a very, very high price. He is universally despised in the mainstream media. Um, he won't even be interviewed there anymore. I mean, he doesn't, you know, doesn't see the point anymore. He's the prime minister he's of Israel. Actor. I think he's a fantastic actor playing a role just like Trump, just like Biden, just like Kamala Harris. What's in it uh, for him? Uh, well, you have to ask him, but he's the guy who got PLO Fatah into Israel. Case closed. PLO Fatah is Iran. Netanyahu brought Iran into militarily strategic territory of Israel. Nothing that you say on the other side can weigh more than that. Israel is the state created to protect the Jews from genocide. Iran is the state that promises to repeat the Holocaust in Israel. And Netanyahu is the guy that brought Iran or Iran's daddy, Pilo Fata, into militarily strategic territory of the Jewish state. I don't think we need to say anything more. Well, there are people on the right who say that Netanyahu is not right wing enough, but um, that's a little strong what you've said here about it. Well, him. I understand that this is very difficult to digest. And the reason it works is that it is very difficult to digest. The show is so good that it convinces everyone. Apparently, it convinces you. And if it continues to convince uh, most people in Israel, then I am afraid that the future of Israel will not be bright. The, the way to defend Israel is for Israelis to realize that they need to vote in a completely different leadership. The people running the country right now have been leading Israel to destruction. And if you look at the a track record of Netanyahu, he has not opposed the Oslo process. He has only spoken against the Oslo process when he is a candidate. And then when he becomes prime minister, his actual policies have been pro-Oslo. Look, he's the one who handed Hebron over to the enemy. That I know, so, as part of the Y agreement. Well, right, it's, it's public knowledge. Netanyahu's track record is public. It's, but, but the rhetoric, the, the, the media sphere is so convincing that it sucks people into an alternative reality. This is why my website is called the management of reality, because that's what they're doing. They're managing our reality so that we cannot understand who are our friends and who are our enemies. And they're trying, and by managing reality, they're trying to turn Westerners against Jews again. And it's working in many places. But as you said, most Americans are still friends of the Jews. So we have to work hard to explain how the world really works before this becomes another uh, Holocaust again. Look, October 7th, I predicted. I predicted October 7th. I wrote an entire book to predict it. It's called uh, 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 the, the Next Holocaust and Its New Consequence and, and, and Its Consequences. The Collapse of the West, The Next Holocaust and Its Consequences. And I said that this was going to happen. And why did I predict that? Because I could... I was studying the entire history of, uh, of what the U.S. bosses were doing. So you can see where this is going. It's, it's going to keep going in that direction unless people wake up. Well, you've certainly given us a great deal of food for thought. I'd like to thank you again, Francisco Gil White, for being with us. Thank you. Ruby. And I'd like to thank our viewers. I'd like to thank our viewers. And don't forget to like us on Instagram and Facebook and uh, Twitter, or excuse me, X, and all the other uh, digital platforms. Shalom. גדלתי בישראל בשנות ה-90. תמיד ידעתי שהעמדות שלי, עמדות של ימין, לאומי, דורשות שכנוע, נימוק והוכחה כדי לנהל שיח. הכרתי והעמקתי בדעות של הצד שמנגד, מתוך מתן כבוד. מהר מאוד הבנתי שהאנשים שעמדו בצד שכנגד, לא הכירו בלגיטימיות של העמדות שלי. היום, 30 שנה אחרי, בצד השני הדברים לא רק שלא השתנו, הם הפכו גרועים הרבה יותר. הרטוריקה הפטרונית, האדנותית, הפכה למרד אלים, מסוכן, שהוביל אותנו ואיפשר את טבח שמחת תורה. אנחנו בערוץ טוב החלטנו להחליף את השיח המכיל והסבלני של הימין בשיח של הובלה והנהגה. רגשי הנחיתות של המחנה הלאומי חייבים להיפסק. 
במועדון היחידה אנחנו בונים את הקבוצה שתוביל את חילופי האליטות ההכרחית בתקופה הקרובה. אז הצטרפו גם אתם ליחידה ותוכלו גם לתמוך ולחזק את הפעילות של ערוץ טוב וגם לקחת חלק בקבוצה איכותית שתיפגש בקביעות ותבנה שיח חדש בחברה הישראלית ותוביל אותנו לעתיד טוב יותר.